Hello and welcome to Insight. I'm Kusum Vijay Tilaka. My guest today is Dr. Diane Jai Tilaka, the former permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations in Geneva and the former ambassador to France and Russia. Dr. Diane Jai Tilaka, thank you very much for being here with us on Insight. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me on, on the show. So I'd like to start um, with a bit of a background because you're quite the personality in Sri Lankan politics and your political leanings might leave uh, some of our younger audience members a little bit confused. Now, uh, you started off um, with the EPRLF. That's Not the, really, but go, that's go a, on. That's a major, yeah. that's the major movement that I'd say you initially lent your support to and then you went on uh, to Mr. Vijay Kumar Nathunga, to Mr. Ran Singh Premadasa, Mahindra Rajpaksa and now uh, you are an advisor to uh, Sajid Premadas, uh, the member of parliament and the leader of the opposition. Um, the Elam People's uh, Revolutionary Liberation Front, it's a, it was a Tamil militant separatist group. So could you, for our audience's uh, benefit, could you just tell us what drove you to that uh, movement and how you look back on it? Well, I'll try to substantiate everything I say. Okay. Uh, so, if you were to speak to Suresh Premachandran uh, of um, you know, a well known figure in Tamil politics, he would confirm that uh, K. Patmanabha, uh, who was to be the founder leader of the EPRLF, and Suresh met me for the first time at Peradeni University. They came looking for me in 1978, and this is way before the founding of the EPRLF. And in 1988, when we were passing from Trincomalee, the Northeast Provincial Council, going back to Colombo, we stopped off in Kandy and we came to Peradeni. We came to the Peradeni University canteen and we kind of toasted with plain tea the 10th anniversary of our meeting in 1978 there. What had happened was that, uh, what happened was that uh, Patmanabha was on his way back, having been trained uh, by Dr. George Habash and the PFLP, the Palestinian front, you know, the People's Front for the Liberation of Palestine in Beirut. And uh, they'd read some of my stuff. I was an undergraduate. Um, I'd, I'd written on Leninism and the Tamil question. These guys were Marxists. That's the most important thing. Um, and uh, they sought me out. And I told Patmanabha, look, if you're serious about what you're doing, don't stay in the outfit that you are. He was a member of Eros, Eros yes. and he was uh, heading the General Union of Elam students. I said the founder of Eros, who I like very much because he was a friend of my father's, Eliot Ambiratna Sabapati, he, he took me to a, a bookstore in London and bought me my first copy of Louis Althusser in August 73. The guy's drunk most of the time. So I said, you know, if you're serious, you just have to leave, do your own thing. And then I met him again in 1981 and he gave me the manifesto of the EPRLF which they had founded. Now what made Patmanabha and I work together, what we shared was the idea that in a country that was dividing, in a society that was polarizing along ethno-lingual, ethno-regional lines, leftists who were Sinhalese and who were Tamil and uh, uh, from the various provinces should work together for common purpose. He called it total revolution. Uh, what he meant was uh, a revolution throughout the island. So our primary identity would not be Sinhalese or Tamils and mine wasn't, his wasn't. He happened to be Tamil. He was a Tamil who was fighting for the liberation of that area yeah. but not in the way that the tigers were. Uh, so, we worked together. I was never a member of the EPRLF, but uh, as I said, I'll try to be fact based. Um, fast forward from 1978 to 1985, 86, uh, Patmanabha and I were both indicted in the high courts of Colombo uh, on 14 counts. We were among 23 uh, under the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the emergency. He was the eighth accused, I was the first accused. So we, we walked the talk and I do not regret having done that because it was a noble ambition uh, which was uh, chewed to pieces basically by the JVP which killed off 
non-racist Sinhalese leftists in the south and the LTT which killed off non-racist Tamil leftists in the northern east. So, that was Patanaba, but uh, that was my first rodeo, but that's okay. That's uh, Okay. Well, from the EPRLF on towards uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar Tunga and then to Mr. Anasinghe Premadas, could you briefly tell us about yeah, that? Well, uh, uh, Patmanabha and the EPRLF and Vijay Kumar Tunga were simultaneous. This was in the 80s. Right, okay. In fact, there are photographs of Vijay and Chandrika with the EPRLF and with right. the plot. There were many of us who were working at that time across ethnic lines. Our operation, uh, uh, my group was called the Vikal Pakandam. And there are many personalities you would, uh, you would have heard of who were members. Now it's all beginning to come out. Uh, Ram Manikalingam, Da Palatirana Gamma, Nirmal Ranjit Devasari, Thisarani Gunasekar, Pulsara Lianagay, Kadri Ismail, uh, C.H. Chandra Prima. I mean, they were all in our group in the south. We were not members of the EPRLF, but we were right. partners. Right. But at the same time, Vijay was reaching out to the plot and the EPRLF. He went to Jaffna, he met the Tigers, he went to uh, Chennai, and he met the other groups. Uh, so, Vijay, I, I did four cover stories, signed cover stories for the Lanka Guardian, which was founded and edited by my father, Mervyn De Silva, uh, in uh, 84, 86 about Vijay. The first was uh, A Star is Born. Uh, and there was another saying, Vijay, go against the tide, that was the title. So I wrote these four cover stories because I thought, I mean, this guy is the closest that this country has ever come to. A, kind of Latin American left populist okay. and we became friends. We were together um, in Moscow at the uh, World Festival of Youth and Students in 1985. Um, then when I was underground, um, Vijay uh, hid me for part of, part of the time uh, at his sister's. He actually wanted to stash me at his mother's. Uh, and, and I said, no, I'm not going to do that because you are, uh, you are a political leader and if they catch me there, there goes your political career. So, I'm not staying at your mother's. Um, and then there was an empty house which had been bought by his, in his sister's name, no electricity, nothing. So, I stayed there for a while. Chandrika knows this. Uh, she told me later, I didn't know that he was staying that Vijay was keeping you. I went through his diary and I found the, and the note you had uh, uh, given thanking him when you went off somewhere from there. You hadn't even told him, you had written a note. So, uh, that was the way things went at that time. But that was Vijay. I mean, we were, we got very close very soon. And then Premadasa, you will see there is a, there's a clear continuum. Uh, well, Premadasa, I, I had met as a kid when he came home to meet my father. Uh, and he told me that he, had, he attended the same school that I did, St. Joseph's College. Uh, but when I met him as an adult, I had just been amnestied uh, and I was a minister, I was the youngest minister in the entire provincial council system in Sri Lanka. And he had invited the Northeast Provincial Council uh, to meet his ministers, a few, Ranjan Vijayaratna and others, and all the top bureaucrats in order to expedite devolution. Uh, so, before the meeting got going, we all seated around, I was sort of far corner. Sajit, by the way, was there. Sajit and um, his sister Dulanjali had been brought in for the meeting. They stayed for a little while and then they went. But I think they were brought there at Sucharita to get a flavor of this. This would have been February 1989. And uh, Premadasa looked at me across the table and said, uh, your mother was very worried about you. Uh, I said, I, I know that, sir. You remember the first time we met? And, I, and he had remembered, I remembered. I said, yes, and I told him. And then um, that was the beginning of a, a relationship. Um, when everybody else left, he kept me back. And he asked me some questions, not about myself, about the situation. Uh, this was the high tide of the JVP and also the presence of the Indian peacekeeping forces in the North and East. And we never looked back. That relationship lasted to the day, the hour, the minute that he died. And in a way, it continued after that and still continues emotionally. And then Mahindra Rajapaksa, because I knew what we had lost when the tigers killed Premadasa. Right. I knew what the country had lost. Uh, and they'd killed so many, I mean, between the JVP and the tigers, more the tigers than the JVP, 
they killed so many good people including Patmanabha and Mahinda was the only guy whom I could see who would take the fight to them if he had to. Of course, I knew him because my father had known the Rajapaksas and when my father died in 1999, Mahinda wrote something uh, or he dictated something to probably Dr. Sunimal Fernando wrote it for the daily news and other papers about my father uh, and how he used to sit, uh, he used to sit and listen to Lakshman Rajapaksa and George Rajapaksa and my father discussing politics and how he learned and then how he knew my father when they won the Palestinian Solidarity Committee. So, Mahinda was not an unknown quantity, but from 1999, um, I supported him because I knew that the most important thing for the country at that time to make anything else possible was to be able to resist the tigers and prevail and Mahinda was the guy and he proved that he was the guy. So, I supported him, I would say for about 20 years. Um, not blindly, I mean I was openly critical publicly on television and so on, I have always done that with uh, whoever it was um, until I would say 2019, 2019 when, uh, when Sajid uh, had a chance of getting the nomination, I supported that. I had of course supported Sajid publicly from the same year that your father did, okay. uh, probably a little earlier in the year, 2010. Right. We had both written to the newspapers. Uh, criticizing Ranil uh, and I supported uh, you know Sajid in 2010 probably April. Uh, it was called the Sajid solution in the Sunday leader uh, and another piece in the uh, on ground views the website. So, that has been the continuum I would say all of them are in some way sort of left of center or slightly left of center or anyway left of center nobody really to the right, right. Uh, that is the that is the continuity. This brings us to the constitutional coup and mm. the well they call it the constitutional crisis. Yeah. Uh, there was a very um, f famous or infamous email from you yeah. um, which uh, was in the media. Yeah. Could you clarify because I see a lot of um, the Columbia liberal base uh, sees you as an enemy, as mm -hmm. someone that uh, betrayed that movement uh, and supported what they consider an illegitimate uh, Between what movement? I was never oh, part of any well, movement they were in. Fair enough, but uh, yeah. they, I, I think a lot of people consider the constitutional coup and Mahindra Rajapaksa's uh, tilt at the premiership illegitimate. How would you, how did you see it? Well, it was Sirisena's move. It was right. coming for most of that year uh, from about January 2018. It happened late in 2018. But the discussions had been going on uh, and the best person to speak to that issue would be Tiran Alas because I believe he was one of the intermediaries, Tiran Alas, SB, Dissanayaka. So, this was in the air. Now, this was nothing new or scandalous, they were using an old playbook, um, but they got it wrong and I will tell you why. Uh, the playbook was Chandrika's playbook and again I do not fault her because I was one of the people I was very close to you, not on your list, but uh, is Lakshman Kadurgama. I worked very closely with Lakshman Kadurgama and uh, he, when he was uh, chairman of the uh, council of management of the BCIS, he insisted that I join the council of management and so on and so forth. So, um, Lakshman Kadurgama was one of those instrumental in uh, what was considered to be the ouster of Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe in 2003 and he was uh, replaced by Mahinda Rajapaksa, that was Mahinda's first crack at being Prime Minister. Um, and then Chandrika went for snap election in 2004, which he won. The reason was that Ranil uh, had adopted or had been persuaded to take a, an extreme cosmopolitan liberal line while the LTT was out there and signed the CFA, uh, which brought him head to head with the interests of the Sri Lankan state as it were. 
and the, the president at that time Chandrika was later to be his partner, his political partner during uh, Yahapada there, fired him. There, there was always too much of a gap between what the SLFP, even under its most liberal cosmopolitan leader Chandrika could uh, countenance and uh, the minimum that uh, Ranil and the UNP at that time under heavy uh, liberal, Colombo liberal influence uh, was willing to settle for. That was the gap. So, Chandrika fired him and then she had an election. Now, President Sirisena found himself in exactly the same situation. He went for exactly the same shot, you know, in cricketing terms. Now, I never agreed that it was a coup. The reason is they wanted to have an election. And if you take the court's verdict, it was not that Maitripala Sirisena firing Ranil was illegal. It, it was not that making Mahinda the Prime Minister as the head of a minority government illegal because Ranil himself had only 47 seats when he was made PM by President Sirisena in 2015. It was that they were going to dissolve parliament and, and declare and they were going for elections and they could not do that because the 19th amendment recollecting what happened in 2003-04 said you cannot do that until you know four and, a, four and a half years have lapsed. Now, whether that was wise or not uh, I would leave you to judge because right now we could do with a snap election, we could do with it, but we cannot because um, Gotabe has to wait till March next year if he is to have an election legally and that is having foreshortened, it is not the 19th amendment. If it were the 19th amendment, the election that uh, the opposition leader and the JVP seek so eagerly now could not be held right, yeah. until a four and a half year uh, period has elapsed. So, I would not call something a coup when what they wanted to do was have an election. Have an election. Okay. Now, the, the 52 days had two other serious consequences which the Colombo liberals have not yet digested though they are as you know they are plain, it is it's neon lit. That was the last chance to stop the Gotabe candidacy and that is why both Basil Rajapaksa and Gotabe Rajapaksa sabotage mine the Rajapaksa during the 52 days. You did not have uh, a golf face green 2017 type uh, massive rally of the Pohotua in support of Mahinda. Uh, you had something in Kote and Gotabe's uh, quite extensive social media army at that time uh, was completely silent because they knew what was going on that Mahinda and Sirisena had come to an agreement and if this worked, Sirisena would have run for a second term with Mahinda's support. That would have been the equation. So, the equation was targeted not only by the Colombo liberals, but from within by Basil and Gotabe. So, the last chance to stop a Gotabe candidacy because that was very much in the balance, Mahinda had not made his mind up. But once the 52 days was flipped by the courts and I had, I had advised them not to, not to go, uh, not to take that route, I will tell you that as well. Then the next thing you had and I will not get into that, but uh, what really clinched the candidacy was the Easter massacre. Yes. Until then it could have been Chamal. I mean, I had written in mid 2018, I had written articles saying, you know, give it to either Dinesh or give it to Chama. And before I left for Moscow, I was in Moscow August 1st, I think, uh, I said goodbye to Mahinda and I told him, if you give the nomination to Gotabe, not a single Rajapaksa is going to be able to make it in politics for a couple of decades and all your ambitions for your son, uh, all that is gone. And when Nama came to Moscow in 2019 with Kanchana, Vijasekara and Pavitra, I took them to lunch, I mean any ambassador does that and I said, uh, you know, before I left I told your dad 
that if he gives the nomination to Gota, you are finished, all of you. Uh, it is going to be so bad and I hope he gives it to Chamal or somebody else because it is going to be so bad, I told him. I mean, this is some, you can check it with him. So, the 52 days, I supported that because I knew this was the last chance for some kind of centrist obstacle to an ethnically uh, uh, or ethno-religious polarization. Right. Because the Gotabe project had already revealed its alt-right character. Now, the second thing that the Colombo liberals forget is that they were so high on their own supply after flipping the 52 days, they forgot what happened in February that year 2018, where at the local government elections, mm. the port yeah. were wiped out the UNP and the SLFP which were in office. Now, if they, if the Colombo liberals had any sense of politics which I noticed they still do not, they would have known the safest thing was to go into opposition. If an election had been held, they would not have been down to zero. Ranil would not have been down to zero, the UNP would not have been down to zero. They would have been in opposition, he would have been leading the UNP. Um, but as I said, they were so high on their own supply, they thought that simply because they had ousted Mahindra Rajapaksa from the Prime Ministership, that the whole country was going to vote for them. Instead, you had the debacle. And in 2019, I mean, one of the reasons I was fired from Moscow, where I was by Gotabe, was because on my FB, my own private FB, I had been supporting Sajid's candidacy. He wasn't even the candidate. Uh, he hadn't been given the candidacy. But I was supporting his candidacy in 2019 because I wanted to reduce the margin of victory because I could see that a catastrophe loomed. I had written about that uh, from 2018. I had been warning about what was going to happen, what is happening now. Uh, you've been a pretty consistent critic of Ranil Vikramasinghe and Ranilism. Um, how do you see this latest iteration of uh, the Prime Minister? I, I noticed you've, uh, you've said he's been lucid recently. Um, could you elaborate on your issues of, uh, with Ranilism and specifically, uh, I noted a piece from you from a few years back where you noted uh, Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe's explicit mentions of um, an Austrian style federal model of government and I think you were quite um, uh, adamant in your, in your uh, case against that. Could you elaborate on that for us? Well, few people know uh, that I supported Ranil from 1993 to 1997 okay. and uh, that was even when uh, Milly the Morogoda had gone back, had gone to Harvard and uh, you know, he was quite isolated. Uh, he was uh, with us when we formed the Premadasa Center, Sirisena Kure, Ranil, we formed the Premadasa Center. So, I supported him from 93 to 97. Um, but in 97, Ranil took a sharp turn to the right. Now, I am afraid about the same thing happening to the SJB, that is another story. But Ranil was not always the Ranil we saw from 97 to recently. Um, between 93 and 97, let me take a key issue, the war. When uh, the famous Dimulagala monk passed away, the, uh, the procession, the motorcade from Dimulagala uh, across the country was organized by Dr. Jala Javadana, the, the father of Kavinda Javadana and a staunch member of the United National Party under Rana. He had given air raid sirens to the border villages at that time. Uh, the UNP at that time under Anil was critical of Chandrika on the so called uh, Union of Regions package. Okay. And Ranil had given me an interview, I do not usually do interviews, but uh, this is an old hobby horse of mine. Ranil had given me an interview, uh, it appeared in the Sunday Observer, where he promised a social democratic uh, platform and Imtiaz Bakir Marka has still not forgiven me. He tells me every month or something in you know one of our many telephone conversations. He says, you are the one who told me to support Ranil uh, because you said he can be like Tony Blair and look what happened with both of them, 
right. So, this was in uh, somewhere between 93 and 97, but in 97 what happened was you had the Liam Fox agreement. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ronnie Hill did two things, he signed up to the Liam Fox agreement which completely changed his and the party's attitude to the Tigers. And secondly, he hooked the party up with the IDU, the International Democratic Union, uh, the international gathering of the center right, the two pillars of which were the US Republicans and the British Conservatives. Now, no previous leader of the United National Party had done so. Uh, not je uh, from from DS right down. Nobody had, uh, even though they were perhaps uh, right but leaning. But nobody wanted to get into this ideological battle. But he did that. So from that day, that year, I've been opposed to him uh, on grounds of policy. Now it's nothing personal. We've never had even the slightest personal issue. Um, so, that went on for 25 years and I warned the UNP in print from 2010, look this is going to exterminate you electorally, give this to Sajid and they did not do that. If they had done so in 2019, early enough when Gota was already uh, you know uh, uh, running for office, they held back the nomination. Sajid may not have won, I do not think he would have won, but he would have clocked 45 percent which would have meant that at the parliamentary election, they would not have got the two thirds, yeah. right. So, I opposed Ranil, I supported him and I thought he was doing something right. I opposed him during the long period I thought he was doing something wrong. So, there is no one single Ranil project. I think Ranil adopted a project uh, of, uh, well, as I said the Liam Fox uh, agreement was was one. And this was because of the electoral strength of the Tamil diaspora. I mean, the British political parties repositioned themselves, they did not care about terrorism. But why, I mean, you can understand that, but why accept that as your party's policy and keep on losing elections? Sure. But the, the ideological elements who facilitated and supported this do not support Ranil anymore, they are still around, sometimes the same people, sometimes the same institutions. Some of the institutions no longer exist such as the Berghoff Foundation, right. which Lakshman Kadragama detested. Uh, but the same guys, the Berghoff Foundation which was federalist and also for security sector reform while the war was going on, mm -hmm. which is why Kadragama detested them. Uh, GLPDs will remember all of this. Those people have produced the intellectuals, you know, intellectuals, let us say academics or ideologues, who are still in operation and uh, I believe have made inputs into the uh, SJB's 21st amendment which calls for the abolition of the presidency. It is this same constellation of forces that uh, Ranil caved into and lost elections um, that wrecked the UNP and under Yahapalne it is those forces that pushed for this new constitution which split the bipartisan coalition and which strengthened the Rajapaksa led Pohutva because it weakened the moderate SLFP. Now they have moved on like a bunch of parasites and they, they are hovering around uh, the SJB and pushing the exact same agenda which is an agenda of the debilitation and the weakening of the Sri Lankan state. So, Ranil is no longer doing that because he does not have a party, there are no parasites around, it is just him and I have to say I am very thankful to the guy for whatever reason for having gone into that burning building or you know dive in to, to try to do something about the situation that the country is in now. So, I would say that I mean he is probably a goner, but what he is doing uh, is something that 
I respect him for. You don't see it as a case of political opportunism? Well, it, it, uh, I, well, he saw the opportunity and he took it. Unlike Sajid, he had nothing to lose. Um, but he could have played it safe. He could have played it safe and said, no, I mean, you know, uh, I'm not going to do that. Because he knows the odds. But he's trying, at least I can hear the guy saying something, unlike the Rajapaksas, we know that he's done this and he's done that and he's called so and so and uh, nothing may be moving, literally, but there's more transparency, there's more rationality and at least there's an effort by him. So, uh, I think he's doing something right and therefore, as in 93, 97, uh, I support that effort. Uh, and, and, and the 25 years during which I was a bitter opponent, and he reciprocated. I mean, he's said things about me on television, and it's all public. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, that's over. It, it was never personal. It was political. If I could um, go back to Rana Singh Premadasa. Yeah. His legacy is something of a, of a dual, that's a dual feature to it. Now, on one side, a lot of people in Colombo will remember that period and associate it to Rana Singh Premadasa, the period of uh, the JVP, of, uh, of murders, and a lot of upheaval in, in Sri Lankan society, in Colombo, central Colombo itself. But of course, there's the other side, where is the 200 uh, garment factories that, that you've mentioned before. There's, uh, I think, the scholarship by Dr. Saman Kelagama regarding the second uh, golden and Dave revolution Dunham. and Dave Dunham, the uh, second period of liberalization, the golden industrial period of Sri Lanka. So how do you find the complexities between the Premadasa legacy and do you think it's, um, it's a positive for the current opposition leader Sajid Premadasa? Do you think he should intertwine his political career with his father's legacy? Does he have a choice in the matter? Oh, he has a choice. He has a choice. I just hope he makes the right one. Um, look, the, the killings that you're talking about. Premadasa, few people know this, uh, Premadasa had a long conversation with Rohan Vijayavida, the guy who told me this was the only other guy in the room, Kaili Senanayaka, who's still alive, uh, former leader of the JVP. Um, Vijayavida had wanted to book the town hall for his May Day speech. So, uh, Premadas was Minister of Local Government, apart from being Prime Minister, um, and they went along. And it had been an all-nighter. And Kaylee told me that, now Premadas knew about the JVP, he had attended every single session of the Criminal Justice Commission, which, uh, which was the trial after the April 71 insurrection, every single session. And he had with him Susil Sadiwadana, who was involved and was jailed. Uh, he was a nephew of uh, SWR Ribanonaika, uh, Oxford and Harvard and so on. So, he, he was very clued in on, on the JVP, but this conversation with Vijayavira was very important and we have testimony later as to the veracity of the story. Um, at the end of the day, at the end of the night, Premadasa told Vijayavira, look, I agree with everything you're saying about your, the grievance, social grievances, and the kind of and the changes that this society has to go through, all of that, all of that. But I will never agree with you on one thing, and one thing alone, and that is the use of violence for that purpose. Because if you do that, the state will also react, and the people who will suffer most will be the poor people that you and I say we are fighting for. Right? Now, years after that, many years, decades after that, Vijayavira's son, who is in Sri Lanka now, uh, he remembers his family being taken to meet President Premadas after the killing of their father. And he says, um, President Premadas had told his mother, Vijayavira's widow, Rohana Mama Kiyapude, Ahu Nani. You know, Rohana didn't listen to what I said. The family didn't have a problem with that because they knew that to be true. The boy didn't say, you know, that SOB was lying. He, he just 
related this story. He's back from Russia. He did very well uh, at the university there. I know when I was ambassador, this guy had won. He was the president of the students' council in a place where there are like three Sri Lankans and you know ten thousand students. So, it Pramodas had no choice when he came to office. He declared an amnesty. They released over thousand JVP guys who were in custody, and he said, "I'll dissolve the parliament. I'll give you three ministries. You name the ministries. Let's change this place together." But in their arrogance which has still not left them, in their overweening arrogance and overestimation of themselves, uh, they gave him the finger uh, and, and they went back to killing innocent people, people who voted and so on. Uh, Jaya Jawadana uh, and uh, Ravi Jawadana, the STF, uh, the whole UNP have been fighting the JVP from uh, 86 to 88, 86, 87, 88 and failed. Pramadasa took office on January 3rd, 1989. By November 1989, it was all over. So, he had to clear that space. He was not given a choice. He reached out to them. Uh, so, all the programs were possible only because he did that. But he started Janasavya while the JVP insurrection was on. Round one of Janasavya started in the Hambantota district. So that was Premadasa. And as far as Sajit is concerned, I can't speak for him. But what does he bring to the table? I mean, he is a very good. He's got a very good English public school education. Uh, but then there are one or two others in UNP politics who have uh, a similar educational background. I believe Ruan uh, is another. What Sajid really brings to the table is that he is the only guy in Sri Lanka who has a first rate uh, western education and a sense of and for the poor, the people. Now, of course, it is a different mix from Premanas. I mean, all of us are uh, different from our fathers who have distinguished themselves in various walks of life. Uh, whenever my, my friend, uh, younger friend Nirgunan Thiruchal, Nilan's uh, son, says, you know, but Sajit is not like his father, I said, I said, Nigi. I mean, people would say the same thing about you and me. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, that is true of all of us. We had it, okay. We did the hard yards, we had to go through stuff, but we had it relatively easy because of our fathers. So, so the same with this guy. He has to decide. It, the same decision that Chandrika had to make. Chandrika got it part right, part wrong. How does she stand in relation to her father and her mother? She deviated from it enough to get herself elected, but she deviated from it far too far when she was president and wound up one of the most forgettable presidents we had. I mean, all the public opinion polls, she has got like under 5 percent approval rate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if, it had, if she had tapped into, if she had channeled her inner Sirimavo, she would have finished Pravakaran off. <laughs> you know, it would not have taken Mahindra Rajapaksa to do that. And she could have implemented her new constitution, but she did not. So, Sajit has to make that choice himself. It is an existential choice. And I hope he, he follows the advice given publicly to him uh, by uh, Lakshman Watavala, uh, where at this very big meeting in Nelun Pokona, uh, in his speech, he said, uh, he talked about the 200 garment factories program, he talked about Premadasa's uh, innovative models of management, and he said, uh, you, should take, you should take the path, uh, pick it up from where he left off. Uh, I can't think of any better advice. And in this crisis, Howard Nicholas has, Professor Howard Nicholas has been on your program. And I heard him tell you, and this, this was unforgettable uh, for, uh, I'm sounding patronizing for a young guy, uh, to do a program like that where uh, even an old guy like me remembers stuff. Where Howard Nicholas told you, uh, you asked him whether he was optimistic or pessimistic, right? Yes. About Sri Lanka today. Yes. 
and he said I am optimistic and I will tell you why. He said because I was pessimistic in the late 80s, I just could not see any way out and it was President Ranasinghe Premadasa who turned it around and that is what made me a believer. So I would say Sajid can go another route, but given also the nature of the crisis that we are in, he has got a father who came in when we had two civil wars and one in a presence of a foreign uh, military on Sri Lankan soil and he turned it around. What and, and his model is being studied now, people like uh, Harvard, Nicholas as you said, Dave Dhanam, Saman Kalaigana, there are researchers who have gone into this and said, this guy, he did it. Uh, and I think he is the only guy who, in Sri Lanka certainly or anywhere who cracked the most difficult of economic problems. That is, how do you do growth and equity at the same time? Right. So, right. I, if, I mean I think Sajid that is a route that he should go, not imitate, not mimic, not try to go back, but try to go forward from where his dad left off. In, in your regular columns and on, in the newspapers and online um, and even in our conversation just now, you have been very clear on um, the opposition leader have, that he should have taken up the premiership. Yep. Now I would submit <clears throat> to you that uh, had he taken up the premiership, Dr. Dian, um, it has been about uh, 40 days now. Do, 50, you think, I don't know. do yeah. you think there would have been material changes in the, in the position of the country? And do you think that, for example, would he have been able to survive a headline where instead of Ranil Vikram Singh having printed a trillion, Sajid Premadasi is seen printing a trillion ru rupees, or Sajid Premadasi is seen giving a 10,000 rupee increment to the state sector? Like this, there, there already seems to be a narrative that Sajid Premadasa will not succeed because he is uh, trapped by you know old thinking. Ranil Vikram Singh does not seem to or maybe it is a given with him, so there is no narrative to, to field. But how do you see, would, would things have been really different because they, I, I think I have written about this as well that I believe Sajid Premadasa made a tactical decision as well as a practical decision where he saw the Pohutu majority in parliament, he sees the potential cabinet that he would have been left with, sees the challenges and realizes this is, this is not going to look good for me. And then some people will say well you should not consider tactics when the country is in crisis, but others would argue that if you do not consider tactics then you have no position going forward in which to affect proceedings. So could you just briefly tell us how you see that dynamic and you have mentioned in your articles that you have advised him personally to take on the premiership. I did. So, would you just go on and, and see, do you think he would have succeeded given the current trajectory of, of our country's economy? Well, you know, uh, Sajid and the opposition speak every day with passion about the problems of the people. Now, given that he cares about the people, then I think it is incumbent upon anybody who cares that much about the people to use any chance he gets to go and try to do something to help them. That is before strategy, that is to do with gut, that is to do with an existential choice. And uh, when his father accepted the, the nomination with these two civil wars and the IPKF also here, in his famous speech at the Sugadadasa Stadium October 8th, he made two very pointed remarks. Uh, one, he said, as Prime Minister, I had the powers of a peon but he took the gig. Despite the fact that he was responsible in a major way for the landslide victory, he did not say look you know. Two, he said I am being handed a torch, a flame at both ends. He did not say I am going to sit this one out. That was Premadasa, but Premadasa was, uh, I am, I am, I am, this is not a contrast with Sajid. I mean I would say that about Mind in the first term as well. I would say that about Vijaya, I would say that about Patmanava, if you like, if, if you are looking for continuity. One is, of course, I see them all as progressive. The other is, they are all heroes. You know, uh, they went against the odds. Everything that Sajit and the SJB talk about now, about the gas queues, all of that, I think that they could have made a, even a slight difference for the better. And if they can't make even a slight difference for the better, then they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. 
I am not saying they could have solved everything, but they could have alleviated some problems, they could have attenuated some of the problems. Politics in crisis is about intervention. Now, I hear, I hear this term principle, principle, we are being principled. Principle is a guide to action, not a warrant for inaction. So, he should have got in there and what Ranil is undergoing now is because he is one guy who is unelected. I mean, it is great that he went in there through the door, but Sajit Premadasa as Prime Minister with 52 guys and with the support of the SLFP, let us not forget the group of 40 independents had told him um, clearly, Vijayadasa Rajapaksa said this on television, we will give you the numbers, we will even take portfolios if you want us to and if you do not, we will support you from outside. But even without that, with 52, Ranil does not have anybody but himself. Sajid plus 52 plus the ability for mass mobilization could, would not have permitted Gotabe to do what he is doing now. Gotabe is now trying to undermine Ranil, he is pushing back. But if he tried that with Sajid Premadasa, he would have had demonstrations every day. Let us not forget that before the Aragale, the Aragale was April 3, I think the uh, golf is green. Right, golf, G, G, G. On the 15th of March, the SJB marched to the presidential secretariat and rocked those barriers where the Aragale kids are now camped. It was the SJB which did that. So, if Gotabe tried what he is doing now, he would have been hit by demonstrations every day. I mean, they would have come into his office and pulled him out. Sajid had that capacity and I think he was wrong not to intervene and take the opportunity because had he done so, Gotabe would have been the de jure president increasingly and Sajid would have been the de facto center of gravity. But frankly, he blew that chance. Now, since May 9th, uh, Dr. Dayan, uh, since, uh, since the violence of the bo from both sides and since Ranul Vikram Singh's appointment, um, we have not seen any constitutional reforms. We have not seen fiscal restraints. There has been a revenue increase very recently, some say inadequate. There has been no visible enhancing of uh, checks and balances, no broad governance project. Now, when we use the word principle, I think to clarify, the idea of bringing principle into the matter is to project an outward um, look of credibility, to gain credibility amongst our lenders and amongst our creditors. Now, with the lack of movement in any of these uh, things that I mentioned that might improve our credibility, can you say that this has been a success, this new government with the new cabinet? It has not been a success, but it has been uh, half a step forward because you do not have the Rajapaksas coming and lying to us every day on the economy, the Rajapaksas and their minions. Right, right. Uh, you do not have them silent refusing to answer questions. I mean, there is an element of transparency and some degree of rationality you know what is going on or rather what is not going on. Uh, so, it is not just the optics, there, there, the, there is that opacity, the Rajapaksa oligarchy's opacity is, is gone. You now have uh, the curtain, it is no longer the thick curtains behind which they did all this stuff. Um, Gotabe is of course trying to push back, I mean this happens in every part of the world. Uh, and he is being stupid, I mean he has been stupid before which is why we are in this fix and he is in this fix, but he is really risk taking a huge risk uh, externally because we have read what Bob Menendez wrote to the quad uh, and it is almost like a wanted poster being nailed up there for the Rajapaksas and Gotabe and internally because I do not know whether 
before I get home today, the country is going to be on fire. Anything can trigger it off. And it's not the JVP and FSP which will obviously surf a wave. I'm maybe trying to get something going, I don't know. But it's not them who are going to do it. It's the people. And it could be the people in the gas queues, it could be the people who are mad about power cuts and in low income high rise buildings, it could be the peasants. And if it's the peasants, the peasants know who was responsible and it was Gotabe who was responsible, not the world economy. Yeah. But right? So he's taking a huge risk in not pushing that is not allowing the twenty first amendment to go forward and in making it substantive. Uh, but I have to say critically that I'm not at all happy about the role being played by the SJB and TNA uh, either right. on that score. Whether they like it or not, they are playing into his hands. Yeah, uh, in fact, um, Dr. Harini Amrasuri was on the show recently and she was also of the view that the Argalaya has been diluted to a certain degree. But she sees it more as a lull and something temporary. It is a lull, yes. And do you think that, uh, for example, the appointment of the new Minister of Investment and Promotion and Technology uh, Mr. Damika Pereira, do you think, uh, you mentioned the word oligarchy and we talked about uh, gaining credibility in international markets and with our lenders. How do you see that dynamic, Dr. Diana? I mean, surely having someone who would be considered a member of any potential oligarchy, being a member of the cabinet in a time of crisis. Kusum, uh, I tend to look at everything from a comparative international point of view. That's the way my mind works. That's the way I, you know, I was born into that environment and that is the way I am. So, I know that in situations of grave economic crisis, societies uh, do tend to look to successful businessmen, uh, well, um, who may not actually be that successful. I mean, if you take Donald Trump as an example, but in Latin America, you have these guys coming up as presidential candidates and so on. Um, so, there is that. I can understand why in this extreme crisis you would have a figure like Damika Pereira uh, being brought on stage or deciding that this is his time to come on stage. But the flip side is this, it is appalling, two things are appalling. One, Gotabe Rajapaksa had somebody much brighter than that, whatever you may think of uh, certain allegations about uh, businesses and or stock exchanges and so on. Simply in terms of policy, Nalaka Gudahewa is a very bright guy. And I remember Shangri-La 2, uh, sorry, Vyatmaga 2, Shangri-La 2018. Uh, I wrote a critique of it in the Daily Mirror um, almost a day after. Uh, and the Gota was upset and Dilith arranged for my wife and me and Gota and his wife to have dinner at his place. Uh, I can tell you about that later. But in that critique where everybody was cheering, uh, they given me a nice seat in the robe just behind Mahindra Rajabak. So we were there. Um, and uh, I made this critique of the economic program, the economic program which everybody was cheering. The only person I praised of the speakers was Nalaka Gudaheva because of the speech he made, in which he, he mentioned Ranasinghe Premadasa. So, this guy is a smart guy, everybody has two sides. He was never given a, an economic ministry, Gota never tried him out, but he was the guy who made the development speech at Sh the Shangri-La Vietnamese convention. Okay, but worse than that. And that is to do with everyone, that is to do with Gotabe, that is to do with Ranil, it is to do with Sajit, it is to do with everyone. You know Kusum, I mean if you tell me that somebody you know, somebody close to you is very ill or you know serious illness and if I knew the name of a specialist, I would say you know have you taken him to so and so. Now there are top economists in this country, uh, Nishan, well Howard Nicholas number one. But of course, he's based in Rotterdam. But still, I mean, you know, he cares about Sri Lanka. Nishan Dimer, Dushni Virakon. I mean, these people are, have not been brought together, have not been put on the front lines of this. And you bring in Damika Pereira. 
that's completely crazy. I mean, bringing him in and giving him some way to contribute, okay, it's it's uh, it's all the way down from Upali Vijayawardana, but still, I get it, yeah. I get it. But you haven't done the other thing. During the war, we finally won when we put the best guys, we gave them, mine they did, the best job, Sarat Fonseca in charge of, and so on and so on and so forth. Now, why is it that we do not have Harvard, Nishan, I know Dushni is on some, in some back room advisory group, uh, Indrajit Kumar Swami. I mean, these are the people we should be putting our A team out there and they are nowhere officially. They are not in charge of a thing. And that is a disgrace. That to me, the Dhamika Pereira story, to me, the problem is that here is the guy who they are looking to as a savior when there are brilliant people, brilliant economists. If I could, um, Dr. Dayan, there is two major contentions in Sri Lanka's politics at the moment, or there has always been. Uh, one is our structure of government and the separation of powers, and two is a national question. Um, could you tell your audience your thoughts on Sri Lanka's present contestation uh, with the executive presidency? Now, Mr. Sajid Premadasa, the leader of the opposition, has mentioned the Madisonian model, three divisions of, uh, of government. Also, he's more recently called for the abolishing of the executive presidency. Yeah. There is, I think, a narrative within Colombo that the executive presidency is the reason for all our woes at the moment. Hmm. But as we see right now, the representative democracy itself has failed. So, yeah. parliament itself has failed. Gotabe Rajapaksa was very clear in his um, speech. He mentions that we should either have an executive president, very powerful executive president with all the powers, or we should have a very powerful Westminster system with a very powerful uh, Prime Minister. So, it seems he is not very happy with having any checks and balances and having a split in, in, this, in this power centre. So, does that itself provide you with an answer on how we should best uh, go ahead? Yeah, I got to tell you this uh, Kusum, you know, uh, I can now understand what uh, a trained and credentialed medical specialist, I mean like my friend uh, Dr. Uh, Kamini Mendes and others would have felt when the whole Dhammika Paniya thing was going on mm. at the very beginning of COVID-19. Mm. So, when I listen to this discourse, uh, which envelops, uh, you know, the president, uh, now Mahindra Rajapaksa, I am told, says that, okay, you, you either got to abolish the whole presidency or, you know, it is the same thing. Uh, and uh, uh, a new convert seems to be the leader of the opposition, Sajid Premadas, who moved from the American checks and balances, separation of powers model to abolition, um, probably gone a little way back in his recent Ilakke interview. But when I listen to all of this, uh, to me as a trained political scientist, uh, it is like a, a, a specialist having to listen to the Dhammika Paniya being uh, sort of hawked around as the answer to COVID-19. Look, uh, this is, it is really crazy. The, uh, nobody, not, e not even say AOC or, you know, people who were, were rightly and bitterly opposed to Donald Trump ever wanted to abolish the American presidency. But if you want to say that, okay, Gotabaya is much worse and the Rajapaksas are worse and so on and so forth, then let us really take a deep dive to one of the most respected presidents in our lifetime, President Mohika uh, of Uruguay. Uh, I mean, he is no longer president, but he was a leader of the Tupamaro urban guerrilla movement. Uh, and as a result of which, he was kept for years at the bottom of a disused well. Actually, it was supposed to be a horse trough, and there is a movie about that. Um, and of course, the Tupamaros were almost wiped out, but they came back, uh, they made it back big in politics, and uh, they won the presidential elections. But they never once said, let us abolish the executive presidency, because it is President Juan Bordaberry who put, and the military together, that put Mohika uh, and kept him in solitary confinement at the bottom of a well. But in Sri Lanka, Okay, now you can 
you know, oligarchy, repression, uh, uh, dark dictatorial deeds. Now, hey guys, you know, Suharto was a dark dictator. Uh, the Indonesians threw him out. They didn't abolish the presidential system. Marcos was a dictator. He had martial law, but of course he was originally elected. Uh, Cory Aquino, whose husband was shot dead while descending from a plane, never thought that, okay, we have to abolish the presidency. I mean, what's the connection? If the president is bad, is terrible, you throw the president out. Germany, you don't have a presidential system. Uh, uh, you have a Reich Chancellor, uh, sort of a strong prime minister. Uh, uh, that was Hitler. Mm. So was Merkel. They didn't abolish the, <laughs> the <laughs> political system. So you reform the system if you have to. But you have a president who is elected directly by the people. All you have to do is strengthen the checks and balances. You bring Sri Lanka much more into line with the American and the French systems. Now, Gotabe, I can't believe the guy was actually a citizen of the United States because he says a president must either have full powers or you must have the Westminster model. Does the president of the United States have full powers as per the 20th amendment? I mean, where is he, where is he getting these things from? Um, so, it's a lie. Those are not the only two options. I don't see why the opposition is is saying the same thing, standing upside down, or Gota is standing upside. You know, it, it's a mirror image. Yeah. There are only two options. There aren't only two options. There is no place. I mean, if if you have an a, a surfeit of powers in the presidency, there are changes that all these countries have made, which strengthen the legislatures and various other institutions. Now, in Brazil, you have Bolsonaro, somebody like uh, Gotabe, ex-soldier, right wing and so on. The Chilean left, uh, uh, sorry, the Brazilian left is looking to Lula's comeback in October. Now, Lula was in jail unfairly because the courts put him in jail and so on and so forth. Nobody is saying let's abolish the presidency. They are going to throw out Bolsonaro and they are going to bring back Lula as the president. So, it's not just the opposite, it's the left. I don't get these guys. The whole of Latin America, they're cheering on Gabriel Boric, the young 35 year old left wing president of Chile. Uh, we are looking to Colombia, maybe, uh, and certainly Brazil in October. And as you know, I have the calendar in my head. Uh, and someday, I mean, I've had. Uh, you know, Cuban diplomats tell me someday, you know, when things will get solved with Cuba and the United States, it's when AOC becomes president of the United States. No progressive I know apart from this place, in this country, so I'm not even sure they're progressives, want to abolish a, a directly elected, nationally elected presidential system, not just reform it structurally, but abolish it and replace it with a Westminster model. The Westminster model, as you know, Kusum, and as Edmund Burke was so proud of saying, evolved through tradition, the English tradition. The presidential system was the product of intense deliberation after the 1776 revolution. And Simon Bolivar, who tried to unite Latin America and threw out the Spanish, they also had a choice. And he decided to go with what the United States had done, presidential system throughout Latin America. Everybody has a presidential system except the Caribbean, which is Commonwealth. So, I mean, I'm totally opposed to this. I don't care who says it. I am for the 21st Amendment and I'm totally opposed to the abolition. I have to say this too. If we totally throw out a political system, a system in the middle of a deep and deepening economic crisis, we are committing suicide. Uh, one last joke, and I mean, a joke, and this, uh, uh, an iconic civil servant, Neville Jawira, you have heard of him, of course. Neville, he's, he's, he died about two years ago. Neville had this to say about this whole thing about the abolition of the presidential system. He said, Damn, this is as sane as a family wanting to send the family Rolls Royce to the scrap heap because they think they can't get a good chauffeur. So, you know, sending the presidential system to the scrap heap. 
<laughs> it's crazy. Dr. Dan, on the subject of constitutional amendments, the 13th Amendment, now you've been a very clear supporter throughout your career of yes. the full implementation of the 13th Amendment. Correct. But how do you answer critics that call the 13th Amendment an Indian export? Uh, that we signed the, uh, the IPKF agreement literally with a, with a gun to our head. And would a party or a personality or a president that implements the 13th Amendment, do you think they're in risk of losing the South electorally for quite a few decades at least? Do you see Absolutely it as a not. Absolutely not. I think that anyone who goes beyond the 13th Amendment is likely to have a major singular backlash on his or her hands. And that is why every attempt to do so has failed so far, has failed. The, um, there's a reason for that. So, if it, if it keeps failing, you shouldn't try it. Uh, and that's another problem with the, uh, with the decapitation of, of the executive presidency, because that is the lid uh, as uh, Justice Sharananda and, and the Supreme Court uh, explained in 87, it is not federal, the 13th Amendment is not federal because of the directly elected presidency and the powers of the governor which flow from that overarching presidency. So, you knock that off, uh, then this automatically becomes, it, it grows outside, out of the boundaries, the parameters of the unitary form of state. Now, my support for the unitary state and op opposition to federalism has nothing to do with singular nationalism. It is for the same reason that Karl Marx opposed it when the anarchists were for federalism. And the same reason that you can't get federalism in the Philippines or many countries in the world. You can get, there are federal states, but there are those especially in with a post-colonial heritage, which fear the centrifugal effects of right. federalism. And therefore, they will go, as Indonesia did, for regional autonomy, as the Philippines did, for uh, regional autonomy. So, I am for autonomy uh, with the 13th Amendment as the, the, the most feasible, because we worked with that. We need to improve on it, uh, but I am opposed to federalism. But I am opposed to zero devolution, which is what the Sarat Vira Sekaras and the far right uh, uh, have been saying for a long time. Uh, now, Dr. Dan, we spent most uh, of this hour speaking on local politics. But of course, uh, you are a veteran diplomat and uh, essentially a foreign policy expert. So, I would have preferred to have spent as much of our time talking about foreign policies because that is a, yeah. a common I know, thing I that know, we have, know, unfortunately. I know. Given local politics, that's your PhD. Uh, you are reading for a PhD in exactly. that field, yeah. But uh, I would like to ask, uh, just over the last two years and over the Gota term, over the Pohotua term, could you just give our audience some idea from how you see it as a political scientist and as an expert in, in this field? There has been so many missteps, mis miscalculations. Um, you can look at right even to this day with India and Adani, China with the construction investments rejecting the MCC grant from the US, cancelling the major Japanese light rail project, building the purported financial city um, at India's doorstep with China. Every action in foreign relations has some kind of a cost, especially in terms of the relationships we have abroad. So, could you illuminate our audience on the complexities and, and provide some uh, direction to foreign policy analysts? Because if you are analyzing the last two years of foreign policy, it has been a jumble. I mean, it's, it's been uh, various, various uh, routes being taken, maybe by even different power centers, even within that uh, foreign policy establishment. So, could you just give us an idea of where you see us heading? Well, Gotabe Rajapaksa's tenure is just the last worst phase so far of the post war blunders in our foreign policy. I say post war, and, and here, yes, it is personal to some extent, because uh, to me, uh, May 2009 was the high point of the Sri Lankan state. We had won the war on the ground uh, and then in the same month, we won the diplomatic battle in, Jale in Geneva uh, and secured the support of uh, almost two thirds of uh, the UN Human Rights Council. That's, that was a success. And then it was downhill all the way. Of course, the Rajapaksas fired me six weeks after we won. 
uh, Rajiva Vijay Singh and Udita Deva Priya have been very kind and said that that was the first mistake they made, but no matter. But it's been bumpity bumpity bump, and it wasn't the Rajapaksas all the time. You had uh, Ranil and especially uh, the late Mangala Samaravira, who swung to the other extreme uh, and uh, made that party unelectable by the uh, Geneva 2015 sellout, really. So, what you have had are swings of greater and greater amplitude. Uh, the Mahindra Rajapaksa second term, which saw triple defeats. I mean, we won handsomely in 2009 in Geneva, and then we lost in 2012, 2013, 2014. And then came Yahapalne and, you know, the, the surrender in 2015. Uh, coin, as someone said, uh, coinciding with the 1815 Candian Treaty, the sellout. And then you had Gotabe. Ah, Gotabe. Uh, he did something that Madame Banaraka, who knew Mao Zedong and Premier Zhuan Lai, never did, and nobody ever did. Uh, he actually told President Xi Jinping on the telephone on two occasions and put it in the official communique that he wants to learn the governance yeah. experience of the Communist Party of China. Now, I am a great admirer of the Communist Party of China, for China. And they have done brilliantly, uh, I mean, that economic miracle which none of the Sri Lankan economists talk about, by the way is the greatest in human history, lifting the bottom 50 percent up into the middle class in so short a period of time without colonial possessions. So, great, way to go Communist Party of China, but that is China. Sri Lanka never had leaders who confused our proud, strong democratic commitment with the governance model of the Communist Party of China as distinct from the historical experience of an achievement of the Communist Party of China for China. So, Gotha probably thought, hey, you know, this is an ideological prop I can use for my model of greater and greater authoritarianism or full presidential, full power. Concentration of power. Right. And see where that has got him. Now, that brought him into the firing line, firstly of the Indians who thought on our doorstep, you got to be joking. And then of the Americans who have this construct, especially under Biden, but it was running from uh, the, the Trump period of global, a global contestation between autocracy and democracy. And Gotha took us into the autocracy camp in his discourse, and that is the direction in which he was going. Now, if that were not bad enough or stupid enough, he then double crossed the Chinese over that highway thing and the Chinese wrote to him and said, look, I mean, we put in a tender, it is not even been opened, it is lower than, you know, it is more beneficial to you guys than, than anyone else, but it has been given to this and it, it was all leaked to the Sunday Times. So, you have a role in the hay with the Chinese. And then you walk out, you know, stealing their purse as well. And then you try to, you have a role in the heavy with the Indians. Uh, this is an unmitigated disaster. When it is all so simple, really, what you have to do is know that Sri Lanka's national interest dictates a sense of balance not equidistance or neutrality, but a sense of balance, balancing between India and China, between the West and the East, between the North and the South, uh, securing greater autonomy for us. That is our interest. Whenever we have swerved, uh, as we did for a period under Jaja Vardhana, we paid heavily. All they have to do, all these guys have to do, and from government to opposition, by the way, 
is ask themselves what would Lakshman and Khadragama have done, but they do not do that. Uh, so, you know, I, I do not rule out that a future uh, SJB government, depending on who is running the foreign policy side of it, uh, will not make the same mistakes that the Yahapalne UNP did with Geneva 2015 and then have a huge blowback here because you can see this pattern. After Mahindra's first term, the disaster of the second term, it was doing well economically at a certain point, but still, then you have uh, swing to Yahapalne, swing away from Mahindra to Yahapalne, swing away from Yahapalne to Gotabe, swing away from Gotabe, you know. Uh, so, these oscillations of increasing amplitude are simply because of the abandonment of uh, the, the, the middle path if you want to derive your inspiration from Buddha or the golden mean as Aristotle advocated. Dr. Dayan, one final question, uh, if we can come back to local politics. Just briefly, I wonder if I can get um, a sort of a predictions from you and get it on the record in case we yep. have an election sometime soon. Yeah. All things being equal as at today. Yeah with no crossovers, yeah. if we had a general election tomorrow, what do you think would be the breakdown in parliament the day after the election? Kusum, why are you asking me about a general election alone? I mean, I have heard this, you know, I have heard the SJB, I have heard the JVP, I have heard, you know, you talk about general election is the only answer. I mean, Gotabe will still be there with his 20th amendment. Of course, you will have a parliament that is uh, more radical or more progressive than the present one and then what do we do? I mean then uh, all the MPs can conceivably march and then take him and put him in the Bayre Lake and immerse him for a long time. But it, it, there is something here that does not fit. It is a presidential system still, he has got his 20th amendment on the books. Uh, you can only do so much with the general election. I mean okay we can hit the streets, but that does not help the economy. You are doing all this against the context of a huge economic crisis. So, the slogan of an immediate or early general election which I support has to be linked with another slogan either for the holding of a early presidential election because otherwise you are faced with the same problem or with the slogan of pushing the 21st amendment through as quickly as possible and by that I do not necessarily mean the SJBs abolish the presidency 21st amendment because they are not going to get more than 60 votes for that. So, if you want to get something done you have to go with the proposition that has a greater chance of success because they start off with the greater number of votes. They may not get to the 150, but something that is closer to 150 than your 52. I mean that is basic American politics, that is how you get legislation through uh, the Congress and the Senate, mainly the Congress, but that has been forgotten. Uh, but yes, you need, a, you need a snap general election, you need a presidential election or you have to go for the general election after you have done 21 and at least got the election commission cleared out, cleared up, right. Never mind the abolition or whatever other radical reforms get the guy's hands off the levers of power. He runs the machine still. The 21st amendment in whatever watered down version will prize the presidential hands off the state machine. So, you got to know what you are doing and why you are doing it. It is not a wish list. Okay. Who is going to win? Um, all right. Um, both elections or only one? Let us go for both. Let us go for both. Parliamentary election, uh, I think the people will hold their nose and vote SJB uh, because I mean you look this way and that way and this way and that way. <sighs> JVP, can they run the economy? Uh, not really, but we like them. Um, they would be great watchdogs. So, make them the opposition, the opposition leader should be JVP. You know, uh, a French, there is a French joke when I was serving there in Paris, I learned that. Um, the joke is, you know, the French are so left wing, so progressive, why is it that they never have, except for once under Mitterrand, 
why do they never elect the communist party or you know real left wing mm -hmm. party and the answer is because the, the the frenchman carries his heart on his left but his wallet on his right so when you go into the polling booth even the people who are talking about the jvp may march with the jvp they're going to think of their economic interest and the sjb as the successor to the unp and this is the swing always you go to the slfp and further left and then you swing away from it to unp -ish, you know I, I think it will be the sjb but very important caveat it will not be a 1977, which is what the SJB imagines. Why? Because they haven't done the work, the enormous transformation that Jaja Avadana and Rana Singh Premadasa, because Premadasa was the head of the organizing committee, did from 1973 to 1977. They revolutionized the UNP. It was no longer the Dudley Senanayaka good old boys party. Unfortunately, I see this this whole Westminster political culture and this swing back to the model taking us back to a Dudley Sarnak type. I mean, he was a great gentleman, but that's not the kind of party that gets you a 5 6 majority. And as JR said uh, in Havana with Fidel on his platform, he actually said it at the online conference, listening to President Fidel Castro. Uh, I won a 5 6 majority at the presidential election in as the election in 1977, if Fidel Castro had been on my platform, I would have won 6 6 right. So, you have to be that UNP, the J.R. Premadasa UNP of 73, 77, which was a populist party. It, it was, a, you know, it was revolutionized. This SJB is not. So, it is going to win. But it is going to win in the way that Ranil Vikram Singh won in 2001, 2004. The more it is like that UNP, which is where the top policy elite, not Sajid because he was Premadasa's son, but the dominant policy elite of the SJB has never fought and won a presidential election. He's never worked with a president. He doesn't know what it's like. All it knows uh, is working with Ranil in the two stints as prime minister, one term each, 15 years in between. So, they'll get a simple majority. They'll have a very strong JVP uh, as the opposition, pushing their back to the wall. And if they do not change their, uh, if they do not really learn from Premadas and adhere to Premadasa policies, which means going for presidential election or abolishing it, because Premadasa could not have done much of what he did if not for the presidential powers, uh, the use of the presidency as a developmental engine. Then they are going to be stuck like Ranil was. Uh, they will not be able to really come out of the crisis, they will do, I mean, they will they will succeed in winning the election and they will hold power for one term, but they will not be able to liberate the country which they otherwise would. Now, the presidential election, Sajid has an advantage. I do not see why he or his party wants to abolish the presidency because that is his comparative advantage. It is him, I mean. The brand. It is the brand, it is the memory and it is the actual story, the narrative. This is what my dad did under difficult circumstances, I can do it. Uh, you can count on me to do it. Uh, the last time you got a choice between Gotabe and me, I lost by only 10 percent. But you think back as to whether you made the right choice. Well, you here is the good news, you have another chance. You can vote for me. Now, he can do that. But why is a guy who lost to Gotabe at Gotabe's zenith by only 10 percent? He was only 8 percent short of the magic 50 percent. Why does he want to abolish the presidency or rather why does he want to listen to those uh, you know the ultra liberal types who want him to abolish the presidency. Now, look at the figures. The UNP February 2018, 23 percent of the vote. Sajid Premadasa, November 2019, 42 percent of the vote. SJB, August 2020, 23 percent of the vote the spike is Sajid yeah. and the presidential election. So, it is criminal folly even from the point of view. The point with these guys is they do not think in terms of political strategy. 
I would only say, Dr. Dayan, that uh, from based on those results, what we would have is a center left, center right, moderate SJB par party in power. Yeah. With a very strong leftist pressure group, which to me sounds uh, just about right. If, if you it's about right, but uh, yeah, I mean not not if it's center right, because if it's center right, they won't be able to implement their policies without. Uh, you know, one-term governments, Dalit Sarnayaka 65-70, is during that period that you had the most militant student movement from 66-68, uh, uh, Peradani and Colombo, and the foundation of the JVP. So, a one-term centre-right Westminster model government is a disaster, which is why Jaya Javadana from 66 December his speech to the uh, Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of the of Sciences, SLAS, F section, Social Sciences. Uh, he made the pitch for a presidential system. This is the same for the same reason that General de Gaulle uh, called into being the Fifth Republic because of what had happened when the Nazis invaded and, and how the system collapsed and so on. So that is why GRD did what he did because there is an intimate connection between moving from that low growth stagnant economy lashed by strikes, susceptible to the volatility of a parliament in a country as divided as Sri Lanka and the high growth jump, we, I mean we had 8 percent growth in the first year uh, and the presidency was the way it was done. Of course, they did not get everything right which is why you almost had a revolution and then Premadasa came in and showed how that can be done also through the presidency. I remember him Telling me one day because there was the all parties conference and there were parties uh, which were for the abolition of the presidency and, and he told me because actually it was on a memo of mine that he had the all parties conference. He said, Diane, do you think that if not for Mr. Jayawardena's executive presidency, our fellows by which he meant the UNP guys would have allowed me to implement any one of my development programs for the people. So, if it is a one term uh, SJB government with a wafer thin majority and a centre right economic policy, um, then that you know it is well, it will only be a marginal improvement. But if it is capped with a presidential victory for Sajid Premadasa uh, or I mean any other decent centre left candidate, I right now I cannot see anyone. So, Sajid would be the country's best bet. Then that is a whole different ball game. Dr. Dan Jayatlik, thank you very much for being on Insight. Appreciate you uh, and the work you do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kuzum. Thank, thank you. you.